Father, we commit this study to you as we embark on it today. And we pray that as we gaze into this book from the prophet Nehemiah, that you will do a deep work of restoration in our lives. Open our eyes that we will see in your word wonderful things that will be life transforming. I not only commit myself to you, but I commit all those who will be a part of delivering this series. As we walk this journey, Lord, we pray that you will open up truth. Lord, that will lead us in the path of righteousness, that we will continue to live and glorify you and establish your kingdom in this earth. We give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm very excited to begin a new series of studies as we look at the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And looking forward to what we will unravel, what will unfold as we walk through uh, this book. It has challenged me. I've already been through it, and I'm going through it now following the plan. And already my heart is blessed and very challenged. So today I'm going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 1, which was just read for us. We've had a bit of an introduction from the video that was played, but I just want to kind of lay some sort of a foundation that I hope that we can build on and then go into looking at the chapter in brief. So there are three Old Testament books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and they all belong together and kind of cover the same general period of time after the Babylonian captivity when Israel had returned to Jerusalem and had begun again the worship of Jehovah in the restored temple. So Ezra and Nehemiah, in the Hebrew Bible, they are one book. In our Bibles, they are two separate books, but in the Hebrew Bible, they are one book. Ezra, he's a priest, and he led an early return to Israel and restored worship in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, they had already ministered to the people before that time and urged them to build the temple. And Ezra went back to restore the worship of that temple. Now, Nehemiah is a contemporary of Ezra, and he led a later return. He was a layman. He was a butler, the king's cupbearer, to the emperor Artaxerxes I, which makes Artaxerxes an ancient predecessor of the Ayatollah Khomeini for Persia. So this area, geographically, that we are looking at, in terms of where the children of Israel were held captive. Today is modern Iran. In, in that time, it was Persia. You can see on the map there, the, both where Persia is. Persia is in the orange sort of color. And then the Persian Empire, which extends beyond Persia, is this sort of yellow color. So the, Nehemiah is a story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem which took place approximately 500 years before Christ came on the earth as a human. It is part of the long history of a troubled city. Jerusalem is a troubled city even today. Jerusalem is always in the news. Uh, when I went there in 2014, the guide that was showing us around Israel said to us, it's the most contested piece of real estate in the whole world. And we can believe that. But Jerusalem is not only a historic city, which for centuries has been the center of the life of the nation of Israel, it is also a symbolic city. Jerusalem is also used in a practical sense throughout the scriptures. Because Jerusalem pictures, in a way, God's dwelling place. That's where the temple uh, was, and that's where God would dwell but we know that in this time that God doesn't dwell 
in temples made with hands. God doesn't dwell in bricks and mortar and glass and wooden doors. But we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. Amen? So God dwells in us. Scripture says Christ in us. The hope of glory. And that's God's desire. Not to dwell in a building. And yes, we come together as the church in the building to worship God. But God lives inside of us. The picture you see there are some ruins of the wall that Nehemiah built. This was uncovered by archaeologists in around about 2007. So the walls that we see, if you go to modern day Jerusalem, the old city, are not the walls that Nehemiah built because they were destroyed. But these archaeologists discovered these walls not so long ago. So in this story, this book of Nehemiah, we see that Jerusalem is in ruins. Jerusalem's walls are destroyed and it's a picture of life. picture of life that has lost its defenses. And you know when you lose your defenses, you are open to attack, aren't you? You are open and prone to attack. So the book of Nehemiah depicts the way of recovery. When the walls are broken down, when our lives are broken down, how do we recover from that? How do we recover from that place of ruin to a place where we have peace, where we have security, where order is restored? That's what the book of Nehemiah is about. This is the first time we're going to study an Old Testament book in this sort of systematic way. So I just want to lay down some general principles that will serve us throughout this study. And whenever you read the Old Testament, I want you to bear these principles in mind. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. According to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and then 1 Corinthians 10, 6 says, Now these things happened as examples for us, but they were written down for our instruction. So when we read the whole of the scripture, but the Old Testament, the, those things are written as examples for us to give us instruction. And then Romans 15, verse 4 says, For whatever things were written down, before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So when we read the Old Testament, even as you read through the book of Nehemiah, you will see there there's lists of names and you might think to yourself, what, what, what does that mean? You know, don't skip the names. I know some of them are hard to pronounce, but I was reading through some yesterday. I read through them, but there is much that we can get even out of that because it's written for our learning. And I want to just say that the primary purpose of the Old Testament, and I want you to really get hold of this, the primary purpose of the Old Testament, I believe there are two purposes. For the Hebrews or for the nation of Israel, the primary purpose of the Old Testament is to point to the person and works of Jesus Christ. That's the primary purpose of the Jewish scriptures, the Torah, the Old Testament we call it, is to point the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, to the person and works of Jesus Christ. Now for the New Testament believers, which we are, the primary purpose of the Old Testament is to pictorially illustrate theological principles that we find in the New Testament. So for every theological principle that we find in the New Testament, there is a pictorial illustration in the Old Testament. So that's why we need to read both. We can't just be, I know we're called New Testament Church of God, but we read the entire Bible, we believe the entire Bible. Amen? So let me just demonstrate this 
quickly. So this is the point I made that, you know, the, the scripture, the Old Testament is to point the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, to the personal works of Jesus Christ. Look how Jesus does this here in John chapter 6, 48 to 51. I'll just read it. It says, your ancestors, before I read it, let me say, this was just after Jesus fed 5,000 people. So let me put this into context. Jesus had just fed 5,000 people after he received a a lunch from a young boy of uh, two fish and five barley loaves. And this is what follows after that, yeah? Jesus is saying to the people, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So Jesus is reminding these people, these are people of the covenant, people of the nation of Israel, who understands what Jesus is talking about. When he's talking about the manna in the wilderness, He's talking about that time when Israel had left from Egypt and they were journeying through the wilderness and they had no food to eat. And they cried out to Moses, we're hungry. And Moses prayed and God sent down from heaven food for them. Six days a week, food kind of looked like bread. Yeah, and that's what they ate for 40 years in the wilderness. So... The food came down from heaven. Now Jesus is saying to them, pointing, using that story to point to himself now, just like the manna came down from heaven and you ate that manna and it sustained you for 40 years in the wilderness, I have come down from heaven and I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. Your fathers, your ancestors ate that bread and they died in the wilderness. But I have come down from heaven. If you eat me the living bread, you're not going to die. So you see, Jesus is using the Old Testament scriptures to point to himself, to the person of himself and his works. And that's the the whole reason why God gave the scriptures to the nation of of. Israel. Now let me just illustrate now the primary purpose of the Old Testament for us, if you can move forward. So I mentioned about the pictures in the Old Testament and theological principles in the New Testament. Just run through this quickly. So most of us will know the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, yeah? How they were in bondage in in Egypt and how they were delivered and God used Moses to do that. So I'm just using... Some comparisons here so you can see how what took place there as a picture relates to a theological principle in the New Testament. So Egypt can be likened to the world, yeah, the world that we are of sin that we, that we live in, living as a whirlian, you could say then. Pharaoh, you can liken to Satan, to the devil. The slavery or the bondage that the people were under, we can liken that to the sin that someone who's not saved in Christ is bound in sin. Moses, we can liken to Jesus. Moses is a type of deliverer, yeah? The Passover lamb that was slain on the night when they left out of Egypt, we can liken that to the cross of Jesus Christ because Jesus was slain on the cross. So as they were delivered because they put the, the blood on the door and the lintel, So the cross of Jesus Christ, when applied to our lives, we are saved. The Red Sea crossing, we can liken that to baptism. So they were delivered out of Egypt, but they passed through the Red Sea. Remember, they came to the Red Sea, mountains on either side, Pharaoh's army coming behind them, and Moses stretched out his rod, sea parted, they passed over. So that's likened to our baptism, that when we come to Christ, we ought to be baptized. That's what the scripture says. Repent and be baptized and you will be saved. And then they they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And eventually then Joshua, a new leader, arose and, and he took them across the Jordan 
into Canaan land. And that can be like to living the spirit-filled life. Because, you know, we can be saved, but we're not living in all the fullness that God has for us. God has prom- had promised them, I'm going to give you this land. You're going to conquer your enemies. But they could have kept wandering around in the wilderness until Joshua comes along and he leads them across. So it's the same for us. We can be saved. We can be doing the routine, but we, we haven't really entered over into that spirit-filled life where we take possession of what God has promised us. And then the enemies that they, they face, all the Jebusites and the, all the ites that they face in the land of Canaan can be likened to the battles that we have with our flesh. Because even though we, uh, we enter over and we're living a spirit-filled life, the flesh, that carnal nature, the, the, the person that wants to take control, who wants to be on the throne of our lives and wants to tell us what to do and rule us, we are battling that fight with the flesh all the time. And we have to conquer the flesh. So I hope you can see from that how the Old Testament Scripture relates to the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, revealing the person and works of Jesus Christ, and also for us who are New Testament believers, giving us pictures and illustrations of theological principles that we read in the New Testament. Some good advice that I can give you. If you want to understand the scripture, particularly if you're reading through the Old Testament, put Jesus Christ the Messiah in the middle of every page you read in the Old Testament. Because in the beginning was the the Word. The whole Old Testament revolves around the person and works of Jesus Christ. You should always look for where is Jesus in this? And that will stop you from going into error and all kind of nonsense. Put Jesus in the center of every page of Scripture, not just the Old Testament, every page of Scripture as you read it. So what does the book of Nehemiah portray? Well, Jesus is portrayed in the book of Nehemiah as Nehemiah is someone who encourages himself and the people to endure. And as we look at Jesus, Jesus also endured and encourages us to endure. We see that Nehemiah prayed and he knew God through dedication to his word. And as we get to the end of the the book, we will see how they more or less were reading the word 24-7. And Jesus also got to know God through the scriptures. He quoted the scriptures often in his ministry. So the central lesson I would say for this book is that only with God's help can we actually change ourselves and recover from the damage and ruins of the past. I'm not a writer, but as I was reading through this book, if I had the time and if I had that gifting, I I could write two books from the book of Nehemiah. So I'm throwing the challenge out there to someone here or someone watching online. So the first book is about leadership principles. If you study the book of Nehemiah, you could become a leadership guru. Excellent leadership principles in there. I was blown away when I read it afresh to see what a tremendous leader Nehemiah was and my respect for him just went through the roof. Secondly, there's a book there for someone who wants to write about brokenness and recovery. I think it's one of the best books in the Old Testament that speaks to brokenness and recovery. Amen. So let's uh, look at the memoirs, the diary of uh, this prophet, Nehemiah, and how he led the recovery of an entire city and the rebuilding of its walls. So let me read from the scripture again. I'm, I've chosen to read from the New Living Bible because it just reads in a way that's really easy to understand. There's no sin in that, brethren. Okay, so don't sack me because I'm reading from the uh, 
New Living Bible. What you will see as I read through, it's really easy to, to understand. So let me read it from verse 1. In the late autumn, in the month of Kislev, which is our equivalent of December, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress, the King James says palace, some Bibles say citadel, of Susa. And I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. We say amen to the reading of God's holy word. So notice the description of Jerusalem that Nehemiah receives the report. And just to show contrast here, so Nehemiah is in, remember he's a king's cup bearer, yeah? So he works and lives in a fortress somewhere that's fortified, somewhere that is, is safe. He's working for the king, the then ruler, you know, of, the known, of that world of, of, of Persia. And he receives a report about what's going on back, back home, back a yard. And the report is not good. Because while he's a king's cupbearer and he's living in a fortified city, the report comes back that the walls of the city of Jerusalem are broken down. Remember what I said just a while ago that the pictures in the Old Testament speak to theological principles to us as New Testament believers. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we look at our lives today, we may find there are places, there are walls that are broken down. And when walls are broken down in our lives, it's difficult for us to defend ourselves. The enemy can come in and wreak havoc in our lives. What kind of walls am I talking about that are broken down? Well, it could be a sinful habit that you have difficulty now, if not finding impossible to break. That could be the ruin in our lives today. Some may be engaged in sexual practices, going along with the ways of the world, doing things that we know are wrong, but we're having difficulty in putting those things to a halt, bringing them to a halt. We know that we should not be indulging in these things. But, you know, this happens in the church. Of course, we know it happens outside the church. But it happens in the church too. Then there are those who are caught up with pornography. You don't have to go and look at the top shelf anymore. Right on your phone. When you're innocently looking for something else, pop. And in that moment, you have a choice. Do you close that down or do you indulge? Some are addicted to drugs. Some are hooked on tobacco and alcohol. Some are hooked by gambling. Work hard but race their resources. Some have a bitter spirit. Some have a critical attitude. Complain about everything. Find it hard to praise and be uh, happy for other people. Always has to criticize. And maybe this just started as something quite innocently. But as you keep doing that, you go deeper and deeper into it. And the walls become broken down. It just becomes part of who you are. Bitter, critical, hateful. It becomes a habit. Your defenses are broken down 
This is what the scripture is talking about when we look at Nehemiah and his walls, the walls of Jerusalem being broken down. It says that the, the gates were burned, destroyed. And then there are those who have experienced some horrible things in the past. Maybe have been sexually abused. Maybe have been verbally or mentally or psychologically abused and it scarred you it's something that you feel ashamed about you may even think it was your fault and it's something that you don't want to go back to in your life's journey you you don't want to think about that you don't want to talk about it there's nobody you really feel comfortable to talk about it because it's a bitter experience and you feel betrayed all this is talking about our walls being broken down and the gates of the city being burned. When you want to run, when you want to hide, when you feel so badly scarred and bruised that you've lost your self-confidence, you think little of yourself that you're just no good. You're experiencing great personal distress. This book of Nehemiah, if you will walk this journey with us, will show us the road to recovery from our broken down walls. And all the things which I've just named and many more, which I know there are people in this room and there are people who are watching online who have experienced some of these things. And these things are, to this day, even though you're a grown adult, still weighing on your mind still weighing you down, still like a chain that's preventing you from being all that you can be in God and Christ. Well, we're going on a journey, and I want you to take the journey with us. And my prayer is that at the end of this journey, you will be totally restored. Those walls that are broken down in our lives, will be repaired. The gates that have been burnt will be restored. And I've titled this series Faith United. Somebody say Faith United. Because this is a journey that we are going to take together. And God is going to be restoring us together. So we're going on a journey Faith United, We bear each other's burdens and so we fulfill the law of Christ. Amen? Amen. So we're going to look at some of the steps, or I should say, we're going to look at just one step. There are several steps in this book that Nehemiah took to restore the walls and the gates. But we're going to look at one step in chapter one today. And as with the other leaders of the church, we will walk through the steps and principles uh, one by one. So let's look at the next verse, uh, Nehemiah 1.4. This is Nehemiah. He says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah, where he was, he was okay. He was in a fortified place. He had a good job working for the king. So he could have just brushed this aside and said, well, tough look for them. I'm okay, Jack. You know, they're going to have to sort themselves out. But what we see here is a man who has deep concern. He has a deep sense of personal concern and he's willing to face these facts that he has received from his brethren and weep over them. And that's the place to begin. When our walls are broken down, we have to be concerned about that and we have to weep and mourn. It says here that um, this went on for days. It wasn't just a a kind of one-off thing. For days, it says that Nehemiah mourned He fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. 
Well, I've certainly done some fasting in my time and prayer. Um, have we done any mourning? <laughs> well, that's a spiritual discipline. They would say you ban your belly and bar. <laughs> Nothing wrong with doing that before God. You know that God understands that? You know that God understands those, that wailing and those tears that you shed and that pain that you feel. So Nehemiah didn't hold this in. You know that's one of the most dangerous things you can do? Because you're just turning injury on the inside. Let it out. Ball. Holler. Cry. Weep. Lie down on the floor and stamp your foot. Shout out in anger. And while some of us are smiling and finding this funny, but if you're in that place where your walls have been broken down, don't try and contain that. Bring it to God. He knows anyway. Bring it to God and exercise this spiritual discipline of mourning. 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 And that was accompanied with fasting. And prayer. Word of God says a broken spirit and a contrite heart. God will not despise. He always welcomes that morning. That's amazing, isn't it? Because most of us, if we hear that kind of bawling and mourning, we don't want it to ruin our day. But the scripture says a broken spirit. Someone who's travailing in mourning. God, I'm hurting. I can't get over this. I've tried to get past this. And I'm struggling. God's arms are open. He welcomes that. He says, come my child. Now we can do some business together. Amen. So I want to encourage you if you're in that place. Start where Nehemiah started. That's where he started. The scripture said he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed to the God of heaven. Amen. And there are four things I want to draw out of his prayer this morning that I hope that we will find helpful. The first is, in his prayer, he recognizes the character of God. It reads, verse 5b, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commandments. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. In other words, Nehemiah is saying, God, the ruin that you are concerned over, I am also personally concerned over it. He recognizes the character of God. And he comes to a God that he knows that as a result of his praying will respond to him. God's not going to turn his back on him because God shares the same concerns that Nehemiah has. And God will respond to his prayer. He gives attention to prayers God gives attention to the prayers of his people but not only does God give it attention to our prayers he has the power he has the ability he has the know-how he has the grace with which he can respond when we pray to him you know we can listen to people's problems but we can't really help them sometimes and it's good to listen, and I'm sure they feel better for it after. But God has the power, not just the authority. He has the power and the authority to respond when we pray to him. And that's who God is. That's part of his character. That when we cry out to him in sincerity and earnestly, and particularly when it's something that concerns God himself and his heart, he will respond to us. So that's where Nehemiah prayer starts, in recognizing the character of God. 
The second thing we see that Nehemiah did was he repented of all personal and corporate sins. And it reads, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family. And I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Notice the approach here of Nehemiah. He's not pointing fingers at other people. He's facing his own guilt, isn't he? He's not being self-righteous. Well, God, you know, it's not me because, you know, I've, I've been living, I've been doing my best. It's them. They're the ones that brought this trouble on themselves. Nehemiah doesn't do that. He puts himself in the picture. And what Nehemiah is saying, God, I've also contributed to this problem. And he prays and asks for forgiveness. He confesses his sin and also the sin of his father's house. There's no excuses. He doesn't try to blame anybody else for this. And you know, when we try to excuse ourselves, when we are in the wrong and we try to excuse ourselves, you know what we do? We're just blocking that repair process from taking place in our lives. Just like anybody, you know, if you're a, a gambling addict and you can't admit to it, hard for anybody to help you now. Hard to get help. So when we make excuses and point the finger, and it's easy to do because as human beings, that's the easiest thing to do, to run away from our own guilt. But we have to admit we're wrong. We have to declare that to get any help from God and to begin this process of delivery and this process of repair. We have to face up to who we are. And in this case, even the sins of our ancestors, of our fathers. And then the third thing that Nehemiah does, he reminds God of his gracious promises. Reading from verse 8. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. So here in his prayer, Nehemiah is reminding God that he is a forgiving God. He's a God who restores. And if you read, take time to read in Deuteronomy chapter 28 through to chapter 30. This is what Nehemiah is quoting from. Here where Moses prophetically outlines the entire history of Israel. And he said that they would disobey God. He said that they would be scattered amongst the nations and that they would go into exile. And that's where they find themselves in Nehemiah's time. But also God said if they would turn away from their sins and turn again to acknowledge him, that he would restore them and bring them back to their land. And Nehemiah in his prayer is reminding God of this gracious promise. It reminds me of the story of uh, the prodigal son who took his possessions and went and squandered them in the far off land and then found himself in a place as a good Jewish man amongst the pigs, which we know was an unclean animal to them. Feeding them, he was so hungry, he even wanted to eat their food. But he came to his senses. And he said to himself, even the hired servants of my father are living better life than this. And he said, I'm going to get up and go back to my father. And what I love about that story is that the father, I've been looking out for him every day. Wow, what a father. 
That's just like God, our Heavenly Father. When we are in a state of being broken down and being destitute and reach our last end. Maybe you walk with God in the past and now you've backslidden, you've turned away from God. And you're thinking, would God have me back? Yes, your Father looking out for you. And it says that when one day he saw his son in the distance. And you know, it, it was a disgrace for a big man like him, the father, to go out on the road and run. They didn't do that. You know, they had a prim and proper walk. But when the father said, what's weird? I'm his son that... Man, him dash off in court and he take two foot. <laughs> and he found his son that was smelly, dirty. Look at him, he had a wash for days, tired, thirsty, hungry. But what did he do? He embraced him. He welcomed him back home. That's, that's God our Father. Someone give praise in this house. So if you're wondering if God wants you back, let me tell you, he's looking for you right now. He's looking for you right now. So come with your baggage. Come with your weight, come with your shame, come with your sin, come with your reproach and disgrace. Bring it all to God the Father. He's welcome. He will welcome you. He'll put a robe on you, put a ring on your finger. Party, party. Hallelujah. Amen. God is gracious. And God is a restorer. Amen? Amen. The fourth thing that Nehemiah did, or he said in his prayer, he requested specific help to begin this process. And it reads from verse 10. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. Then he goes on to give us his title. In those days, I was a king's cup bearer. Nehemiah had to find a, a place to start. It wasn't going to be easy what he had to do. Remember, they're under the rule of the, the Persian Empire. So Nehemiah had to become political. Is the church scared of being political? <laughs> Nehemiah had to interface with the powers at B. And I'm not going to go into the next chapter because whoever's coming next week will go into that. But he had to become political. And in a sense, what Nehemiah was asking for in terms of the restoration of the, the walls of Jerusalem could have been seen by this king as a threat to his own kingdom. So let's, let's understand what he's going to be asking the king for. This is no small thing he's asking the king for. Because in fortifying Jerusalem, it could be that they revolt and rise up against this empire. And you will see that in, in the next chapter, that when he goes to the king, he's, a, he's afraid. He's afraid to ask. But he prays. Specific prayers. He needs authority to pass through certain regions to get back to Jerusalem because the enemies were there. And they, if they had any idea what Nehemiah was getting up to, he wouldn't have even reached Jerusalem. He would have killed them. And you see later on in the book where he goes out to survey the wall at night. <laughs> he don't tell anybody what he's doing. You don't tell everybody what you're doing. <laughs> there are some things leg legitimately that you can do at night. <laughs> so that's what Nehemiah does. 
But he realizes that this is going to be a huge thing. And he cannot go before the king in his own strength, with his own cleverness, to ask for this permission. He's going to ask for time off from work. That could cost him his life. He's going to ask for permission to pass through enemy regions. He wanted papers. You can't touch me because the king says, I'm blessed. And he asked for resources as well. Why? What a cheeky. <laughs> He's asking for much, isn't he? But this comes out of his days of mourning and fasting and prayer. And so it is. If our walls are broken down, we have to pray specific prayers to God. And what we have before us at times may seem insurmountable, may seem impossible. Lord, I will never get over this. My life is permanently damaged. I just can't see how this is going to be repaired. Yes, it can be repaired. God is a resourceful God. He will give you the papers you need to walk on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of enemy and nothing will by any means harm you. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. That's the God that we serve. God will give us the resources. He'll give us the, the authority. He'll give us the time off to repair our lives. For him to repair our lives. Amen. So I'll say to us today. No matter where you are today on this journey. If you feel spiritually. Mentally. Psychologically. Your walls are broken down. You have to begin somewhere. And I want to say that on this day. The 6th of February 2022. Is a good day to start that, that process. Lift your hands if you agree. It's a good day. It's a good year. To start that process of recovery. Amen. Let's be upstanding together. Oh Lord. Father help us as we have listened to your word. To examine the walls in our lives. Lord, some of us, our gates have been burned, our walls are broken down, we are defenseless, we're just open to attack and the enemy is having a field day. But today on the 6th of February 2022, a repair process as we walk this journey through the book of Nehemiah has started as we delve into the scripture and we, you show us the pictures and the illustration from this story. Help us to grasp the principles in your word that will lead to full restoration in our lives. That at the end of this study, we won't be where we are now, Lord. But you'll bring us into the light of your day, to a new place. To a place where we can confidently and boldly stand in you and become all you want us to be by your grace. And so, Lord, I also pray for those in here who have not yet experienced Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Whatever they have gleaned from this word, may they too come to you, Lord, in full surrender confessing their sins to you and looking to you, the faithful God, who's able to forgive them and restore them, oh God. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I take my seat, I just want to say, if there's anyone in here who wants to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you feel like your life is broken down. You're weary, you're tired. You're not sure if you can go another day, another week. Jesus extends to you an invitation to be restored. He wants to lose you of your burden of sin and shame and the weight you're carrying. He wants to give you peace that only he can give.
not the peace that this world offers, which is temporary, but he wants to give you peace. If you're here today and you hear this invitation and you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, please just raise your hand where you are so that we as a church can pray for you. If you're online, you can do the same. There's a voice speaking to you right now that you know what that person is saying? I need to make a commitment. Well, that's God speaking to you by his spirit. That's God drawing you by his spirit. If you're here today, I want to pray with you or we want to pray with you. Anyone here? Well, I praise God that we've all made that commitment to Jesus Christ. For those who are online, please just say this prayer with us as we say it. Heavenly Father, your word is life. Your word is truth. And your word has revealed I am lost in my sins. And I need Jesus to save me. So Lord, forgive me of all my trespasses. Wash me clean with the precious blood of Jesus. And take control of my life. I surrender my all to you today. Empower me to live as a victorious Christian. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that at home, wherever you are, and you're watching or listening to this, please do get in touch with us here at Harvest Temple. We'd love to support you on this new journey that you've embarked on. And if you are not in this vicinity of Wolverhampton, find a good Bible-believing church to become a part of where you can be nurtured and you can be uh, helped and you can grow in your newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's clap and give praise to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. As we believe by faith and give him thanks for those who have come into the kingdom.